glory the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, to you all be all the glory. To Jesus be all the honor. Father, to you, to you, to you, to you be all the glory. On adoration for Father, to you and to you alone be all the glory. We give you all the praise, for it is another day to come before you. And we pray, Lord, that you have your way. Come and reign graciously in the midst of your people. Touch each and every one of us, so that at the end of today's gathering, O God, our life would have been taught by a divine hand of the Lord. Thank you for answer to prayers. To you be all the glory. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And amen. Your 
difference is clear. I'm on God or God. You are the only true God. I'm on God or God. Your difference is clear. I'm on God or God.
Keep me going higher every day. Jehovah, keep me going higher every day. Oh, Jehovah, keep, keep me, me going I 
will be a friend of Jesus. I die. I will be a friend of Jesus till I die. We will be a friend of Jesus till we die. I will be a friend of Jesus till I die. We will be a friend of Jesus till. We die. I will be a friend of Jesus till I die. I want us to pray now. I want you to present yourself unto the Lord. I want you to tell the Lord that you have come because you want to be a remain his friend. It is the beginning of Easter 2024 retreat of the Watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. And tell him that you have come. Tell him that you have come to be refurbished. Tell him that you have come to be worked upon. That you might be and continue to be his friend. Tell him to walk in you. Yes, Lord, come and have your way, O oh Lord. Come and have your way. Come and have your way, the God Almighty. We have come unto you at such a time. We draw in ourselves from the activities at the face of this life. Lord, that we may consecrate this hour. And this period, and this is unto to you. Lord, we lift up your name. Oh, we lift up your name. Yes, we lift up your name, Lord. we lift up your name. Yes, I lift up your name. Oh, yeah, Jehovah, above every other God. Above every other God. Lord, we lift up your name. We lift up your name. Lord, we lift up your name. I lift up your name. Lord, we lift up your name. Oh, yeah, Jehovah. Above every other God, Lord, we lift up your name. We lift up your name, Lord. I lift up your name. I lift up your name, Above every other God, Above every other God. I lift up your name, Lord. I lift up your name. We lift up your name, Lord. We lift up your name. Oh yeah, Jehovah. Above every other name. Above every other name. Now we lift up your name. I lift up your name. We lift up your name, Lord. We lift up your name. Oh yeah, Jehovah. Above every other name. Above every other God. Lord, we lift up your name. I lift up your name. Lord, we lift up your name. We 
the Lord. Praise the living God. I welcome every one of us once again to this special Easter retreat of the Watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement worldwide. This retreat promises to be a time of personal and deep encounters with the spirit of grace. The one sent from above to help our infirmity and inabilities in our struggle through life. He is the one sent by our loving and merciful Father to open our eyes and to grant us awareness, grant us deep insight into the things the Lord has freely given unto us. This day and throughout this retreat, the faithful Father, whose good pleasure it is to give us the kingdom, will grant us enablement to switch calms. He will come over even at the point of our needs and cause us to come over to his side to partake in and be in possession of those things he has freely given unto us. The man of God the servant of the Lord in our midst has opened our eyes to understand that two kingdoms are at work, each one laboring to get our attention and cooperation to establish their base in our lives and to use us as a launching pad and their kingdom. In this retreat, the Lord, the head of uh, the kingdom of light and life, urges us to Make good consideration and good judgments and switch calms to ensure that we are on his side and firmly rooted in his kingdom. This good consideration and good judgment stem from the fact that God will never hold or withhold his inexhaustible resources in these last days of grievous lacks in the lives of multitudes. In these days of great needs and the horrible challenges facing our generation, this understanding will be prominent in all the messages the Lord is bringing our way. This is the retreat. We need to open our hearts and receive and uh, benefit from everything that the Lord has uh, in stock for us. I would like every one of us to stand on his or her feet and open our hymn books to hymn number 206. Let us sing and defy our hearts and uh, prepare to receive from the table of the Lord. Selected hymns and songs for Christian fellowship number 206. <laughs> Fresh 
situation and circumstance in around our lives. We lift up the name of Jesus above every gang up from the kingdom of darkness against our lives, against the provisions of God for our souls. Lift up the name of Jesus the name above every name, name at the mention of which every knee bows. We lift up that name right now. Above every situation in every heart, every frustration and every confusion, Lord, we ask that the power that is in this name will tear apart every veil that has hitherto covered the eye that has hitherto covered the heart, that has made the person not to profit from the reign of God's word. Dependable Father, I ask that your right hand of power will move and will dismantle every opposition to your word in our lives and cause this world to give the desired dividend. That every one of us We'll have a testimony at the end of this time and will be a part of that kingdom for which Jesus died. Thank you very, very much. Glory and honor and power and dominion be unto you, everlasting King. And let your grace shine into the depths of our heart to bring us into that for which you called us, and let us be brought into it without measure. 
Glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' victorious name, we pray. And amen. The message before us titled, God sent his son, the prince of life. Bless you. God sent his son, the prince of life, to bless you. It is a heartwarming and gladdening information that the Almighty God, the creator of the ends of the earth, sent his son, the one in whom is life, the one that is the word of God personified. He sent him into this world to bless you. When I mean you, I mean you personally. Yes, the singular purpose of Jesus leaving the glories of heaven and coming down to this earth that is filled with gross darkness and troubles is simply bless you. Let us look at our lead scripture in Acts of Apostles. Chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer in the night hour. And a certain man, lame from his birth, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked, and arms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and limp, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he who sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which, was, which had happened unto him. And as the lame man who was healed held Peter and John at and Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's porch, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man whole, this man walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son Jesus whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired the murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God had raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea. The faith which is by him had given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had shown by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the ages began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you, and it shall come to pass. 
that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among his people, from among the people. Yeah, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Verse 25, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised his son, Jesus Christ, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Prior to the coming of the Son of God, the Prince of Life, the Lord Jesus Christ into this world, our lives were alienated from God. Our lives were completely separated and alienated by reason of rebellion and sin. Man was under the unfettered influence and dominion of the devil and man's life was at the devil's whims and caprices it was whatever he chose to plant he planted it the life whatever he chose to accomplish he accomplished he had unfettered influence he had unfettered dominion when the man and his wife were cast out of the garden and uh, into the realm of this world where the devil had already been cast down to. And then an angel and the flaming sword were put at the entrance of that uh, garden so that the man should not return. He should go out there under the influence of his new master and uh, will be able to know the difference by the experience he would pass through. Under this satanic influence and interaction, the wickedness of man became great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart became only evil, and that continually. We see this in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. This situation is regrettable and very painful in God's heart because of the love in his heart for man. He had created man. He had longed for children that are image and after his likeness. He had angels, innumerable company of them. He had created every other thing, living and non-living. But then he needed somebody that was like him. He needed children. And so he said, let us make man our image after our likeness. So he went ahead and created man, and the man became the center of God's love. He loved him because it was a part of him. It was not long the devil came around and lured the man into rebellion. The devil had rebelled earlier and had been cast out of God's presence, out of uh, heaven and cast into this realm of the earth. And so when he deceived the man and his wife into rebelling against God like he did, passed through the woman and got the man, God had to cast them out. Now, after casting man out, God could not contemplate losing the man of his love forever. He could not contemplate losing his children and going childless. How would he lose man forever to share the fate of Satan who had earlier rebelled and had been cast out? How would he lose man and send, send him to hell, a horribly unimaginable place of torment that was specially made? For the devil and the rebellious angels with him. 
And now man has obtained the same fate by getting into the same rebellion that these angels had gotten into. Their fate had become hell. Their place of punishment had become hell. Because the same rebellion that took uh, Satan to hell, took the angels that rebelled against him to hell, the same rebellion that made God to create hell in the first place, was the same rebellion they entered into. And so the righteous God would not condole such evil. But then, being the object of his law, we'll find in Matthew 25, verse 41, that hell was originally created for Satan and for the angels that rebelled with him. But then, by reason of the same rebellion, man was uh, destined to be there. Being the object of God's love, the Lord planned not only to rescue man from this self dictated jeopardy and trauma, but also to restore him to the original glory and blessings prepared for him before he was created. To achieve this, God transformed his world into a human being with the purpose of, number one, representing man and uh, taking his place to bear the punishment of death, the result of man's sin of rebellion. The Bible has uh, stated and that in numerous places that the wages of sin is death. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, God had spoken concerning man. He said, don't eat the fruit of this tree. And freely eat every other one, but the one that is in the midst of this garden, don't eat its fruit. In Genesis 2, 15, and the Lord took man and put him into the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That was uh, the commandment of God to the man. Keep him submission to make him responsible and uh, uh, submissive to him, gave him that rule, that law. But it was not long, the devil came along in Genesis chapter 3 and told the woman, wife of the man, that doing that which God had forbidden them to do, was not going to bring the result that God promised it would. Originally, woman and her husband had been created like God. They were already like God. And the devil deceived them into looking away from their present position into seeking that which they already had to develop a covetous mind for that we thought that already provided them. He said, if you disobey God, if you rebel against him, if you cast his commandment over your head and refuse to obey it, you will become like God. You will not die. The consequences he told you is not, uh, is not uh, there. It's not possible. And uh, they obeyed the devil by choice, they obeyed God. They chose to trust the devil and they trust God. And the moment that happened, died. They were cut off from the source of life. They were cut off from God that had been ministering life. On the life of God had been flowing in their lives. So when God came, the sin of rebellion, the sin of disobedience 
had made them naked. Whenever any person commits sin, comes naked, back naked. It is your relationship with God, your submission to God, your obedience to God, you are living according to what God has demanded that brings the clothing of God's glory upon your life. For the moment somebody rebels and sins against God, that glory departs from him. That clothing removed and he becomes naked. The people that are in the occult, the people that have known the depth of Satan, and the people whose eyes God can open from time to time. They can recognize somebody that is in church, somebody that has a physically clothed like a Christian, like a child of God, but who is living in sin. A, a way to identify that person spiritually, either by the enablement of uh, devils or by the opening of the eye of the individual by the Spirit of God. The way to know it person will appear naked. Spiritual realm will appear naked. That was why when Adam and Eve sinned against God, as God, they heard the voice of God in the garden, they saw that they were naked and they ran. And the moment they told God, we were naked and we had to run to hide, said, what? Being naked, that means you have done the thing I asked you not to do. You have eaten of that fruit. So it can only be rebellion. It can only be disobedience to God's law that can strip somebody naked spiritually. In the day that the children of Israel committed idolatry in the wilderness, when they were dancing around the, the molten calf, and Moses came down, and discover that what God told him in the mount was exactly what had happened. People were in sin. They, are, they were in rebellion. Approached Aaron, and he asked Aaron, said, Aaron, what did these people do against you? What evil did they commit against you that you should make them naked? Moses, having the insight of God, has seen that the multitude, generality of the children of Israel, were standing stark naked spiritually. And it was a confirmation that God had told him, these people have uh, committed sin. And he asked Aaron, why? Why did you make these people naked? So, God, before he pronounced punishment on the people that uh, partook in that rebellion, first the devil, then man and the woman, he made a promise of uh, remedy. He said unto Satan, serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, her seed will crush your head, but you bruise his heels. That was mentioned made of uh, the mission of Jesus Christ on earth. So, at the time appointed, the word of God became flesh. So we can call him the word made man. Jesus Christ, the righteous. He came into the earth and it took the penalty of death, the result of man's sin of rebellion against God, took it upon himself. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 says, the wages of sin is death. In verse 20 of the same Ezekiel chapter 18, the word of God reiterates, the wages of sin is death. Death exists in three forms. And so when Jesus came, to stand in as a representative man, just like Adam was a representative man in the fall. 
at the Garden of Eden. So death that came unto Adam passed to all men. For that all have sinned. Jesus, the second Adam, when he came as a representative man, the word of God that became flesh, he came to take upon himself a death penalty that was uh, already gazetted against man for his rebellion. That is social justice. That is a representative social justice. When he came to die, the three forms of death that visited upon him. Death exists in three forms. One, spiritual death. Spiritual death simply means being cut off or separated from God. So that day when Jesus was hanging on the cross and the Bible says that all of our sins, your sins and my sins, sin of the whole world, came upon him, was put upon him. He became sin for us so that we can be brought to be the righteousness of God in him. The moment he became sin for us, the thing that connected him to God was. We recall that earlier, Jesus had, as it were, bragged to his disciples when he made them know that many of them would be offended him that night and many of them will forsake him and uh, go their way and run away but he reiterated his conviction understanding the knowledge that he has that uh, father who sent him will not leave him even though all of them but his father will not leave him alone because that he Jesus the son would always do the things that please the father but on that particular hour when the sin of the whole world was imputed on him, when he became sin, the father, who he had bragged with, forsook him, cut off from him. He died spiritually. He became separated from God. That was why he cried. He couldn't be a idiot. Couldn't, the physical pain, the torture, could not make him cry. But when the father cut off from him, when the father forsook him, he cried, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? So he died spiritually. Then death also exists in the physical. There is spiritual death, there is physical death. Physical death is the separation of the spirit and the soul from the body. It is the spirit and the soul that give the body the strength to respond to stimuli, a strength to walk about, to talk, to hear, to do all the things. It is the spirit and the soul that give the organs of the body the quickening to function. The moment the spirit which possesses the soul departs from the body, that body becomes lifeless. The body without the spirit is dead. So, after that Jesus had died in the spiritual, was cut off from God, then it wasn't long. The Bible says, yielded up. The spirit departed from his, uh, from his physical body, and that physical body died. Again, the third aspect of death is death in hell where there is punishment, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that uh, Jesus, who ascended into heaven, first of all, descended into the lower parts of the earth. He went to heaven. So in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, we see the record of scriptures concerning this point I've made. Hebrews chapter 2 Verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should test death for every man. 
Jesus was made a little lower than the angels when he took the form of human beings, when he took flesh. And in that form, he suffered death for every man. He, this God-man Jesus Christ, also came to present himself a model. He not only came to die and pay for our sin of rebellion and disobedience, to satisfy the demands of the law so that man could return to God. He not only did that, God also sent him into this world to be presented before human beings that have been reconciled to God. A sample or an example of how the reconciled man should relate with his God and walk with him. Jesus was given the assignment to present himself as a model, as an example, as a sample of how the reconciled man should relate and walk with his God, the Almighty. That's the second reason or purpose Jesus coming into this world. Thirdly, the third reason is that this God-man, Jesus Christ, has been ordained by the Father to repackage the original glory and blessings meant for man. Before the fall, even before the creation, God had pronounced a very uh, unique place for man. All of his creation. He had made man the head. He had made man to have dominion rule over everything that he had created. He had packaged a lot of blessings for man. But these things were lost at the Garden of Eden at the fall. But when Jesus came and recovered man by paying for his, his uh, debt, he paid for the things that man should have been punished with and paid the debt that man owed God. The debt that man owed God was the debt of obedience, which obedience man could not pay. At the rebellion and at the fall, the obligation to obey God was broken. But when Jesus came, made up his mind, said, in that body that you have prepared for me, I make up my mind to your will, O God. And when he came into this world, he went strictly that commitment. And from the beginning of his walk on earth, to the time he departed from here, there was no guile found in his mouth. There was no sin. He was pleasing to the Lord. He lived and uh, everything about him was a pleasure. At the time of uh, baptism, the Lord confirmed saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At the Mount of Transfiguration, the father Father reiterated, saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Using the mouth of the demoniac at uh, Gadara, the devils also testified, saying, What have we to do with you, you holy one of God? The devils testified, but not only God that gave the testimony. Even the devils testified that Jesus Christ was the Holy One of God, meaning this one. Holiness is the absence of sin. And then human beings represented by Pilate the king examined him very, very scrupulously. Examined him in detail when they brought several charges against him and discovered and proclaimed not less than three times publicly to the entire world, saying, I find in this man no fault at all. So, God gave testimony concerning him that he was sinless, was pleasant to the Lord. The devils gave testimony concerning him that he was the Holy One of God. Human beings 
represented by Pilate, gave testimony concerning him after thorough examination that in him was found no fault at all. So, this man that was a representative man, this God-man that was a representative man, now was ordained to repackage the original blessing, the original glory that God had made for man, the object of his love, and release the same unto man. These uh, blessings include deliverance from all that sin has brought in his life, all the bondage of ill health, sicknesses, diseases, infirmities, all manner of uh, health challenges that uh, people suffer from today. The places are filled with a lot of uh, pestilences. The Lord Jesus came to recover the health of man, to heal him and grant him health. Originally, all the goodies of God that were in the garden were given to man to access. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the word of God says, God had packaged all things, every blessing, richly for us to enjoy. But that very provision was lost at Eden by reason of sin. Jesus Christ was mandated to return man his original blessings and uh, glory. So that we will be able to enjoy the benefits of uh, the provisions of God. The relationship that should exist between man and man, between man and God, was a glorious one, was a wonderful one. And it was like that before the fall. It was so glorious. It was so healthy. But after the fall, the moment sin entered, their relationship with God became odious. They began to run away from God. But Jesus Christ now came to bring back that glorious relationship so that a man can relate with his God and be happy and relate with fellow men, fellow women, and be happy. Such glorious relationships the Lord Jesus came to restore. So that in places, in families, between husband and wife, between parents and children, between children and children, where there are toxic relationships. In church, where there are toxic relationships, where people's heart jump into their stomach the moment they see their fellow brother or fellow sister because of toxic relationship, where people suffer from ulcer and related diseases by reason of unhealthy and toxic relationship. By the time Jesus brings back what he, was, he, has, he has been packaged to do in the lives of the people, all such things will be of the past. This repackaged blessing comprising all the resources of heaven that are available to man is rooted in a major blessing. The blessings that the Lord has packaged and empowered Jesus by reason of the redemption he accomplished at Calvary. The blessings that he had empowered him to return unto us, to make us to enjoy, they are rooted in one major blessing. And that is uh, as stated in our lead scripture in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 20. Let's see. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, has sent him to bless you. By what means? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. God has 
empowered Jesus. He raised him up from the dead and sent him to bless you. You as an individual, you as a member of the church, you as a visitor that has come to this Easter retreat, you as a, an invitee, you that may be in your house and you are listening to what the Lord is saying, you are the object, you are the person that he is directed, directing the information to. He said he has sent his son Jesus to bless you by turning you away from your iniquity. That is the major blessing that draws all other blessings. Turn somebody away from his iniquities. This foundational blessing is the root of every other blessing from God. And so, all you are getting in all the blessings that you can testify about, talk about how God has prospered you, how he has seen you through in your academic work, how you met first class, how you are now a PhD holder, how you are now a professor, how you are now you know, a very successful businessman and your business is flourishing, how that uh, the Lord has given you a wonderful husband, a wonderful wife, wonderful children, and they are all doing well, how that the Lord has healed you and uh, all the trauma of the past, they are gone and gone forever. Since the time you had that uh, healing experience, uh, symptoms have not returned, and they will never return. Now, there is one blessing that is the father or the mother of these other blessings. In Psalm 32, Psalm 32, let's see verse 1 and verse 2. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no more guile. That person is blessed. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 7, this is the mother of all blessings. Turning you away from your iniquity separating you from your sins, sending the sins away and you being apart from those sins. Romans chapter 4 verse 7. Saying, okay, let's read from verse 6. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness apart from works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The word of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 makes it clear from verse 18 that God no longer counting your sin against you. He knows that all have fallen short of his glory and have sinned. But he has provided a solution. That solution is uh, Jesus Christ the righteous. That solution, if any person takes on that solution, in question with mantle, he will overcome it. He will be victorious over sin. But if somebody neglects that solution, then that person will receive the punishment originally meant for the sin that uh, had been paid for. That punishment because the solution provided by the father who is the judge was pawned, was neglected, was rejected. The way you want to understand this situation is that a man gave instruction to his children and said, this new garment I am giving all of you, this is rainy season, don't go out. Don't let the rains beat, don't soil the, the dress. 
we are going somewhere. I am going to get some things ready and uh, we will all go to a very you know, important uh, ceremony. Don't let any person. And if any person soils his own dress, he will not go with me that uh, place. And he gives the instruction. And as he goes out, one person among them went out under the rain and slippery ground slipped him off and he fell down and rolled his garment in the mire and his garment became badly soiled. And then shortly the father returned and behold, this one has soiled his garment. And we are about to move. He said, I told you, you can't go with me and the child was crying and saying, Daddy, please, I want to go with you. I want to say, but I told you, you can't go in this state. As he cried and cried, and the lover of the father now, you know, aroused, compassion aroused in them. Now said, okay. Goes inside, brings out a bucket of water, puts some detergent in it, brings out a dryer, and said, now my son, I don't intend to really miss you. I want you to go to the back, take the water I have provided. It has an agent inside it that can remove all the dirt from it. I've also put the dryer there. By the time you finish with it, put it on the other machine and it will dry. Then you can wear it and come and join us. We are moving quickly. And the boy says, Daddy, please, I, I, I will not be able to do that. Go and wash, go and dry, and present your garment again good to go with me. Otherwise, you will not go with me. And the boy refuses that solution that his father brought. Finally, father kicks and he leaves him behind and goes. Now the question is, what was it that made the boy to miss the journey? Was it because he soiled his garment? No. Because his garment had been soiled, but solution was provided, and he neglected the solution. That is why the word of God says in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, God sent his son into this world because he so loved the world, sent his son, that if any person believes in him, he should not perish but have everlasting life. But he said again, he that believeth on him should not perish, but the person that believeth not. What happens to him? Was it because the boy could not uh, obey the father initially and uh, keep his garment spotless? Or was it because he spawned the solution provided by his father? Obviously, it was not the first. Because he spawned the solution. Because the father has already looked away from the first mistake, giving him opportunity to amend. But the boy spawned the solution. That is the reason he missed the journey. That's why in the book of John's Gospel, chapter 3, Verse 15, the word of God says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is come. Solution is come. The panacea for the trouble has been provided. Light is come. But men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. In Romans chapter 1, 
Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. It said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who resist the truth in unrighteousness. The reason the wrath of God is come upon them is because the truth came, light came, solution was provided, and they resisted it by reason of uh, their unrighteousness. Today, I want to ask you, are you among those who are in church but you are still struggling with sin and you are overcome by it, I want to tell you what God says in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23. Jeremiah 5, 23. Listen to what you have done to yourself. From verse 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withheld good things from you. Now look at from verse 23. But these people have a revolting and a rebellious heart. They have revolted and gone. Neither said they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, who giveth rain, both the former and the latter in each season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. He said, God has reserved the blessings that he has gazetted of old. He has reserved them for us. He has made them available unto us in spite of uh, the wickedness of our lives. But he has demanded that we should return. We should no more be rebellious. That we should come back to him in repentance and receive forgiveness of sins so that the original blessings he has prepared, he will pour them out upon us. But these people refuse. They say, we will not do that. And the conclusion in verse 25 says, you are iniquity. I've actually turned away these good things from you. And your sins have withheld these wonderful resources and provisions, even that the Lord has uh, made available. They are the things that uh, have jeopardized our blessings. You are hearing the word of God, but sin is still having dominion over you. Your life is still odious and repulsive to God. And uh, many men and women are practically avoiding you. Hey, you've been coming to church, you've been an old-timer. Or you have uh, come to church and got tired of uh, all the rebukes of the word of God that will always fall to you and you have stopped coming. But today you have an opportunity of hearing what God is saying. God is uh, admonishing, he is commanding, he is uh, persuading that you do something today unfailingly. When your attitude is so repugnant and uh, you have very poisonous and heart-piercing words, the people that hear you get pained because uh, you are reviling is horrible. The things you say are very damaging to the heart. It is necessary that you recognize that those things are there that have withheld good things from you unless you don't want to prosper by God, unless you want to cut corners, you want to climb in through the window to go through some other means, unless you want to ride at the back of the devil to go obtain the things that are freely made available to you by God Almighty. In spite of your age, in spite of your position in church, in spite of your past testimonies and experiences that people around you used to talk about, what is your state and standing before God today? Is your heart right with God? Or are you presently burning with lust in your heart? 
lust for money. Money by all means. Covetousness is gripping your heart. Greed and avarice. These things have, uh, that have swept men off the course of God's righteousness and drowned them with many sorrows. That is what you are cutting. That is what you are embracing. You want to go the way that have drowned many. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, listen to what the Lord has to say concerning that kind of life you want to go. You want to grab money. You want to get it in a big way. That is what has saturated your heart. And you are pursuing it by all means. First Timothy chapter 6 from verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we carry nothing out of it. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that must be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, unto which thou art also called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. The time past of your life has been glorious, has been good, but in recent times you have derailed. Your heart is filled with a lot of covetous practices. It is necessary that you should recognize that the loss of the flesh has made our society today terribly sexualized. Terribly. From the head to the soles of the feet. A man, very responsible, occupying a high position in society, to the person that is uh, in the ghetto. Everyone young and old, little children, little boys and little girls, gray-haired men, people that are bending over by reason of age, are pursuing after lost of them, pursuing after immorality. A society, the entire world, has been terribly sexualized. And everything now is uh, reduced to Talk about sex, about sex, about sex, about immorality. Everywhere you open the, the, the television, you open the internet, everything has been zeroed to sex. Are you in church? And you are plagued with this drive to gratify the flesh. And you are just like other men and other women who know not God. You want to be acceptable in the midst of enemies of the cross. And so you dress and appear like them. You speak like them. You dance like them. You extort others like they do. For you, this is business. Take church out of it. This is business. That's the language of those who want to perish right from the church. Go to hell. Right from hearing the word of truth as is uh, Given from the pulpit of many colors. They said, This is business. Take church out of it. And by that, to enter into sharp practices, they begin to do things that are not acceptable to the Lord. They begin to extort others like uh, the people of the world. You identify with God and His church, and uh, that is why you are here now listening to me. But you give bribe to get a job, get employment, to get a contract. A favor you are not qualified for and you call it PR. Yes, you call it PR. 
You can bring down others with your mouth and actions in order to take their positions. And you are in a church like ours where righteousness and holiness are not compromised. Yet, the reason your life is deteriorating by the day maybe because you have many more pastors than those behind the pulpit of many colors. You are listening to other preachers in the internet and everywhere who make a mess of the grace of God. Who tell you that grace has taken care of everything since Jesus has been punished for our sins. So, you can sleep with men, you can sleep with women, whether you are married or not. One preacher I stumbled at in the net was very busy and the very very powerfully, frantically saying, let no man judge you because you had sex, whether you are married or not. Let no man judge you because Jesus has taken care of it. The death of Jesus has removed every sin. And he quoted scripture. So, whether you are married or not, and you have sex with anybody, whether that person is married or not, is not a sin. You don't have to bother yourself about that. Jesus has taken care of it. He has taken away our sins. He said, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. So, whatever you commit as sin, don't just uh, let your heart condemn you and don't let others condemn you. Jesus has taken care of it. There is nothing that can be, that can be so toxic, so repugnant to God. Nothing that can be so wicked than this kind of doctrine. And people who have been overcome by sin try to justify their evil by now making a doctrine out of it. They make a mess of the grace of God. And uh, it is important that we should understand that all those teachings are delusions that are coming from false apostles. The word of God calls them deceitful workers who are parading themselves as apostles of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 13 to 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And don't marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is not a big deal, not a great thing, if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. They wear the color, they call themselves bishops, they call themselves apostles. You see them decently dressed and you call them man of God. Man of God, evangelist, bishop. But the word of God says their end shall be according to their works. Let it sink into your heart. God has sent his son, the prince of life, whom he raised from the dead to bless you. Acts 3, chapter 3 and verse 26 says, the, the, the focal point of the blessing, the foundational point of the blessing is by turning you away from your iniquities. That is the foremost blessing. That's the foundational blessing. Every other blessing in your life is built upon this uh, blessing. Blessing that come, comes from God. Make no mistake about it. Sin is a reproach to any person. Don't let any person or teach you in any way to begin to meddle with sin. Sin destroys both in time and in eternity. If only you acknowledge your sins, that they are hateful and hurtful to God. If only you recognize that to destroy the effect of sin, the punishment in hell, that to destroy the power of sin and the crushing guilt of it, Jesus came and died. He has borne all our sins away and we don't have to carry them along any longer. In the days of ignorance, however, God has overlooked. But today, 
He is commanding every person everywhere to repent and enter into God's blessedness of being forgiven and cleansed. There are two aspects of this work of grace in man's life. The first is your recognition of the evil of your doing, the sins that have plagued your life. When you acknowledge them, when you recognize them, and you understand that these evils you have made a habit of, that has some assaulted you over the period, have been very, very grievous in your sight. They tend to amount to crucifying Jesus Christ again, even in your life. When you recognize that and uh, you become sorrowful that you have been a source of uh, sorrow and disgrace unto God, you return to him. You ask for mercy. You ask for forgiveness. The Lord, by reason of the blood of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, will forgive you. He will cleanse you of all your sins. Then, all of the punishment that should have been yours taken away. All of the burden and the crushing guilt of sin in your heart and conscience will be taken away. And you now are a brand new person. But as long as you have time to live in this world, there is still temptation, there are still troubles, there are still things that can shake that reality in your life. That is why God does not stop there. He makes sure that from the place sin has been driven out, from the place the, the mystery of iniquity has been overthrown, from the place that the, the demons that have been projecting and uh, you know, pushing you into sin, from the place they have been driven out, it is necessary that somebody greater it you know, replaces that place. It is dangerous to leave it. It's dangerous to have a vacuum. Because Jesus says, when the evil spirit is driven out of a man, he goes about and seeking rest, finding none. He will return to the place from where he was driven out, saying, let me go and see whether there is still space there. And if he comes and finds that the place is empty, garnished and swept, what will he do? He said he will go and get seven other demons more wicked than him and they will return and occupy that place. And the last state of the man will be worse than at the beginning. That is what is happening to many people. They come to church, they hear preaching, they hear the word of God like this, they are convicted, they cry, they ask God for forgiveness. But they stop there. They don't understand that there is need for Jesus Christ to come into their lives, occupy the space of their souls, unite with their spirits, and then form a new creation. So that when the devil comes, he's no longer seeing the place empty. Jesus will have occupied it. So you need to embrace Jesus, to invite him into your heart, and let him come in, unite with your spirit, and form a new creation. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. That being the case, you have accommodated in your heart, you have invited in your heart, you have received into your spirit the power of God to overcome sin. Because Jesus, the Bible says, is the power of God. You have uh, accommodated and accepted into your life the very life of God. Because Jesus says, I come that they may have Zoe, God's own life. That they may have it more abundantly. Jesus is the life of God. In 1 John chapter 5 from verse 11, the Bible says, there is a witness, a testimony that God has given concerning self and concerning his son. He has given to all of us eternal life. But the secret of this eternal life, Zoe, is that this life 
is in his son. Whosoever therefore receives this son has received this life. And any person that spawns the son, rejects the son, does not completely surrender unto him, does not allow him to come and unite with his spirit, then that person will not have the life. Because the life God has given is the life to live like God, to love like God, loving your enemies, to hate sin like God hates sin, to hate every iniquity and to love righteousness. In Psalm 45, he says, well, the Lord was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows because he loved righteousness and hates iniquity. In the same way, when that same person, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, enters into your life and unites with your spirit, he will bring in that quality of God's life which he possesses that you will hate iniquity and you will love righteousness. So, it is important that if any person has to live in righteousness, even as Jesus Christ is righteous, he has to have Jesus, the righteousness of God in him. He has to have the wisdom of God, even Jesus. He has to pass through the remaining time of his sojourning here on earth with Jesus Christ united with his spirit and he will be able to please the Lord and overcome every contrary situation, every trial, and every temptation. Brethren, it is possible to live above sin. It is possible to live above the temptations that flood people's lives every day. It only takes a decision to cling unto Christ, to hold onto the word of God, to unite with him, with him in your spirit. And he will come in with every provision that God has made that you should be victorious in this life. When this happens, you will see that you will pass the remaining time of your sojourning here on earth pleasing the Lord. You will pass the remaining time that you have on earth, you know, overcoming every temptation and every trial. This is what grace is all about. This is what being born again is all about. This is what being regenerated, being a child of God, this is what it's all about, being a Christian. Otherwise, it's fake. Otherwise, it's a delusion and a counterfeit. It is time to switch camps, brethren. It is time to come over to the Lord's side. God is making abundantly available every needed grace, every needed enabling resources to transform your life and to change your destiny. The time is now. You don't procrastinate. You don't wait and say, by tomorrow, I will uh, think about it. No. The people that told Paul, you come next time, I will go and think about it. They never, never thought about it again. They never got the opportunity to embrace life again. And such kings and such princes are languishing in hell right now. You have the opportunity with you. You can come over to the Lord's side. You can switch camps today. You are born in the camp of uh, those that have been coming to church and at the same time living in sin. You can switch camps and come over to the Lord's side. We are people live by the grace of God above sin and above the turmoils of this life. There is no position you will occupy in church or in any uh, relationship that will give immunity against trials, against temptations. There is no level you will reach and then the devil will be afraid of you and will not come near you anymore. If he was not afraid of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the righteous, if he looked at him face to face and said, you bow down and worship me and I'll give you all the things that you see in this world. There is no single person that he cannot come to to try to floor him, to try to pull him down from the grace of life. 
The time to act now. You need to take advantage of the resources. God who sent his son in Romans chapter 8. He sent his son to die for you. He sent him to pay the maximum, the ultimate price for you. How do you think that now you are in need of eternal life? Now you are in need of, uh, of, uh, of uh, being saved? You are in need of uh, being born again? You have made several attempts. You have tried, but uh, it's not working. And so you give up. You are looking for a particular kind of experience. Because you've had the testimonies of people. This one said when he was, uh, when he had the word of God, that uh, Jesus appeared unto him and spoke to him. Yes, I have heard me testify like that. And it is true, very real. I can still remember the experience. But there are diversities of operations of the Spirit of God. It's not... Uh, bottled in one way that he must deal with you as he dealt with me. But the important thing is, is there hunger in your heart? Is there, are you interested in a new life in Christ Jesus? Are you interested that sin should no more have dominion over you? Are you interested to break off from sin, from all the things that some assault you over the period? You are born in church, you are born in one ministry or the other in church, but you know before you as you sit down, before you as you are there listening from your home or anywhere you are, or later you are taking this thing from the YouTube or any other place and you are listening, but you know that sin is a lie. Your wife may not know, your husband may not know, your parents may not know, your children may not know, but you know it. You know that you have been camouflaging over the period. You have been making up Show you yourself as a child of God, but something is thinking in your life. This day is a day of truth. It is a day that you will tell yourself the home truth and say, Lord, I have actually said myself. I have actually done evil to myself. Today, I open up to you. You know my life, and I know it. My life is thinking, help me. I am thinking, help me, deliver me. Like Peter cried out on that day when he looked away from Jesus and began to look at the storm. The Bible says he began to sink. But I thank God for his humility. I thank God for his forthrightness. I thank God for his openness. He cried. He said, Lord, save me. I perish. And the Lord responded. The Lord will respond to you today. If only you open yourself and tell the truth and say, Lord, this has been my life. I have not really been a child of God. I have not really been victorious over sin. But I acknowledge the power of God to keep above sin. Titus 2.16 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. It appeared unto you right now. It is there with you. And what is it teaching? It is teaching, it is working out that we, denying ungodliness, Rejecting ungodliness and every worldly lust. We should begin to live soberly. We should begin to live righteously. We should begin to live holily in this present life. And it is only at such question and testimony that we can begin to look for the said appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to take us away. If you are not in that experience, I am sorry. Not be able to make it. at the trumpet sound when the archangel will shout when the dead in Christ will rise and the people that are alive will be changed to meet the Lord in the air. It's a pity you may not be you will not be there. Not man, because you must have overcome sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. That's the word of God. Therefore, yeah, today, the grace of God is available to change your life, to transform your life, to change your destiny, to make the sentence of death upon your life to be taken away, to make the burden and the crushing guilt of sin upon your conscience to be taken away. 
and to make the power of sin that has really some assaulted you now and again in your experience to take it away. Because the power of God that overcomes is not available to you. Jesus entering your life will unite with your spirit to make you a new creation. Rise on your feet and let us pray. You need to take this opportunity as we sing. You need to take this opportunity. Search your life. You need to call upon the Lord and tell the Lord, speak the truth in your inward part. Don't let anything deceive you. Let the God of heaven, in hymn number 74, let the choir sing while we touch through our hearts and get ready to talk to the Lord. Just as I am, without one plea.
You are there, and it is clear to you that sin has dominion over your life. But you want to break free from it. Or you exercise real freedom from it at the early part of your testimony in Christ. But today, you have slid him back like the dog will return to eat the vomit. Like uh, the pig will return to its wallowing in the mire. The things that you once destroyed in your life, you are building them up again, unwittingly, without really being conscious of what you are doing. But the word of God has made you know that all is not well with you. Have opportunity right now to make amends with the Lord, to return to the Lord, to come to receive life that has been provided for you freely. You have opportunity now. You have not uh, given your life to Jesus Christ before. You have been a churchgoer. You have been a member of uh, the watchman being born by parents who have been watchmen. But over the period, you have not uh, encountered the power of God that saves from sin. You are there coming and going. You may have even joined one minister or the other. But you know that uh, your life is far from God. You are not born again. You are not regenerated. You are not a child of God. The spirit of God uh, is not testifying that you are a child of God. You have an opportunity right now. Come forward and let the power of God manifest this very hour to set you free from the power of sin and from the power of the devils. All of them that are in charge in the lives of the children of disobedience. Even the prince of the power of the air. His power, his influence over our life today shall be broken. You need to take your decision now. You need to move, take a step out before the Lord and surrender and say, Lord, I come unto you without any plea, without any excuse. It is evident that uh, you are alive. Your blood was shed for me. I want to take advantage of the shed blood. I want to have my heart cleansed. I want to have the record of my life in your book. The record is condemning me. I want to have it uh, cleared. I want to have a new life. Today is a day of salvation. This time is the appointed time. You need to come forward and call upon the name of the Lord. Tell the Lord, I surrender unto you. I surrender. This is a practical thing. This is a practical experience. This is something that uh, you, you, you cannot be told about an experience that you enter into and you know that uh, you have had that experience. Several years ago, I had the word as you had it now and I took a decision. Some things cropped up that uh, very night. That very night, I remember in the very hall where I was at that time. In the very hall where the word of God flew like arrows into my heart. And I made up my mind that I'm, I am done with sin. I am done with whatsoever it is. I remember that very night. I can never forget it. I remember what cropped up to want to, to stop that my decision. I remember the very girl I had uh, a relationship with. And we had uh, engaged to marry. I remember her coming up. In a trance, as I wanted to come out to go and give my life to Christ, he was asking me, where do you want to go? You want to leave me? You want to go to where? And as I was looking at her, the conviction began to wane. The conviction began to dwindle. And I was almost coming down flat. And in the process, Jesus appeared by my right side and told me, forget about that girl. Leave that girl come and serve me. And I want to tell you, 
the interest that Jesus showed in my life that made me recover my conviction and uh, run out to give my life to Christ. And the change occurred in my life. An experience that I can never regret of. Experience I can never forget. Changed my life. Jesus Christ changed my life. And he put a hatred in my heart against sin. And he has been with me till today and I can never regret it. That same experience can be yours because he's not partial. All good and perfect gifts come from above, from the Father of light. For with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Therefore, the Almighty God is available. Jesus Christ, the one that died on the cross, he is right by your side. If you see him as I saw him that day, good and well. If you don't see him, he is there with you. He is a spirit and though that worship God should worship him in spirit and in truth. He is there with you. He is longing to receive you. He is longing to cleanse your life up. He is longing to set you free from the bondage of sin and Satan. Open your mouth and call upon the name of the Lord. Let the power of his name break the yoke of sin. The power of his blood, let it break the yoke of sin. Let the power of his word Break the yoke of sin in your life. That is the foundational lesson. The foundational miracle. The foundational release of the resources of heaven into your life. Sincerity is the key. Openness is the key. Open your heart to the Lord. Be sincere. Don't let any person around you distract you. Focus on the Lord and tell him how it is in your life. How sin has somersaulted you, made you odious. How it has made you a piece of bread. Call upon the Lord. Ask him to bring the change. His power is available. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Heavenly Father, I present all that have presented themselves before you. I present them before your throne of mercy. And I am asking and praying everlasting Jehovah. You know their struggles. You know the traumas of their experiences. You know the somersault they have experienced at the hand of the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is uh, at work in the children of disobedience. You know how he has pinned them down and how he has not allowed them any breathing space. But this day, blessed Redeemer, I am asking that you knock him out of their lives. I am asking that as they invite you, Jehovah El Shaddai, knock the prince of the power of the air out of their lives. Let his grip over their spirits be broken and let these ones go free. In the name of Jesus Christ, let the grace of God that brings salvation now walk out in them to reject ungodliness, to reject worldly loss, to reject everything that is contrary to righteousness and to begin to live soberly, to begin to live righteously. Let this grace walk out in them to begin to live holily in this present wicked and adulterous generation, in this present terrible world, sexualized world, a world filled with violence and a world filled with a lot of trauma, a lot of pestilences. Blessed Redeemer, let there be, O oh God, a new level of freedom found by these ones that have come unto you, that they may know that there is a God in heaven, the Almighty, that has a deep interest in their well-being. That they may know that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, that they may know it by experience. And they can begin to testify that Jesus saved me from sin. From this day, blessed Redeemer, let the power of grace work out in them the ability to live above sin. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bless your name because I know you have answered. Lord, as this foundational blessing takes hold of their lives, let all the other ones, let all the other blessings, let the abundant resources from heaven be their portion and their testimony. 
according to that which is written. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' victorious name, we pray. And amen. I am thy, O Lord, I have had thy voice, and it shows thy love to me. And I long to rise in the arms of it, and be gone drawn to thee. Draws me near, near, near. Draws me near, 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 Consecrate me now to thy son by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in time. that this is a retreat gathering in places people may even be uh, camping other locations have been there gathering since the beginning of today uh, but now we are coming together this evening we have to take the next session of ministration before we go and I encourage you not to miss it before we will take the next session and then we gather again by 10 o'clock tomorrow God bless you
Praise the Lord. We appreciate the Almighty God for giving us another time like this to gather together in His presence. There are people that uh, were with us in our December retreat, but uh, as at this time I'm talking with you, a number of them have gone into eternity. So for us to see another time like this to meet is a great privilege. And I'm trusting the Lord that every one of us will uh, take advantage of this time and the opportunity it offers to us to address what we are supposed to address in our lives, in our relationship with God. Easter period is a great time in the Christendom, a time that we celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ, which we all know is at the center of what is called Christianity. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 21 to 20, verse 26, it tells us that if Christ did not rise from dead, the dead, then our faith is in vain. And so, by God's grace, we are trusting the Lord that as we celebrate this uh, resurrection of Christ, every one of us will be brought into experience of our personal resurrection in the areas we all need to be resurrected during this Easter period. And uh, I also consider it a great privilege to be allowed by our Father in the Lord to stand in for him to speak uh, to the congregation. Now, before we go into the message, into the teaching that we have, I want us to sit down and listen to the music ministry as they come with the following songs. Hymn number 158 and hymn number 54. Hold on 
Expected to talk to the Lord and ask Him to speak to you directly as a person. This time that we found ourselves, every one of us uh, needs to talk to the Lord. Tell Him, talk to me. Tell Him to help you. A blessed Redeemer will come this moment to you because you are bidding us to come. They come unto me, all you who labor, a heavy laden. I'll give you rest. This is a sublime invitation. The men ought always to pray. This is a clear instruction. So as we come seeking you this moment, as we come asking that you should talk to us, asking that you should help us, I want to ask Lord that you come and help us, that we may, great Father in heaven, receive the instructions from you. Give us grace to allow the instruction to restructure our lives. Help us, great Father, to allow your word to influence everything about us. These last days that evil are bounding, Jesus Christ said, because equity shall abound. The love of many shall was cold. Obviously, that is what we have found ourselves into. There is a coldness. There is a loss of interest. There is a loss of zeal. Blessed Redeemer. There is a loss of awareness. And there is emptiness everywhere. There is dryness. There is a struggling. There is a, no deep understanding of the things of God. Every one of us, great father, are just, are just like uh, floating in the air. For this period that you have uh, mapped out, I want to ask Lord, uh, what must need be restored by your word? Go ahead and let these things be restored. Put us back to what you have in mind. Even before calling us into ministry. Blessed Holy Spirit. Come and take charge. And uh, bring out your mind. For the church. Thank you. Because I know. You've answered my prayer. At the end of this session. Every one of us great father. Would have discovered. The things you want us to get out from. And the things you want us to get into. To be. In order to be useful. In order to be ready. For the coming event. Thank you for answer to prayers. In Jesus name. We have prayed. Amen. Once again. We welcome you. We are happy. That we are in the program. And we are trusting. That. As we go through the word of God, God will help and every one of us to discover areas of our lives that we need to address. But that is the reason for gathering. When we come to God's presence, expected that discover where we are lacking and then and take steps that will yield restoration now the theme of the retreat as we have been told is a question as well as uh, uh, an instruction 
The question is, will God hurt or withhold his unsearchable and uh, exhaustible resources in the day of lack? Will God keep back his uh, inexhaustible, unsearchable resources and riches for children in these days of lack? Also, joined to it is it is time to switch camp. That is an instruction. Um, but we will be dealing with an aspect of the message that God has uh, given that is intended to help us realize the thing that God Almighty has in mind for us. And it is titled, It is Time to Get Out and to Get In. Time to get out. Get out of uh, those things that God is frowning at. It's time to get out of uh, uh, wickedness. It's time to get out of uh, a lifestyle that is uh, shabby. Lifestyle that does not agree with God's standard for those who are expecting rapture. It's time to get out of uh, anything that is queer, anything that is uh, substandard. And then and get into God and get into godliness. It's time to get serious with God. It's time to get out of uh, weaknesses, out of uh, those things that shouldn't be in your life that has found themselves into your life. And we are going to draw from a number of scriptures in Genesis chapter 12. And let us read from verse 1 verse 4. Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. In Romans chapter. 13, Romans uh, 13 chapter, let us read from verse 11, and that knowing the time, and now it is a high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe, the night is fast spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore Cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife, not in fighting and quarreling and envying, but putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not Provision for the flesh who feel the lost fear of. In Genesis chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 12. And the man said unto Lord, Hast thou here any besides son in law and your sons and your daughters? Whatever thou hast in this city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. 
and the Lord had sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons in law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. For he seemed as one that walked unto his uh, son in law. Sons in law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened the Lord, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, a man laid hold upon him, his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of the two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for your life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Then in Ezekiel chapter 18, the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, let's take the three last verses. Verses 30 to verse 32. Verses 30 to 32 of Ezekiel chapter 18. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of him that died, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and leave. Again, the discussion will be on it is time to get out and to get in. And we have said, get out of a, a lifestyle that does not. Uh, agree with what is demanded by God and get into an expected and a designed and standard lifestyle that is approved. Now, the first chapter that we read, that is Genesis chapter 12, talks of Abraham's call by God and all that transpired in the course of time. Abraham was called by God that he should get out of uh, his uh, kindred, get out from his country, and separate from his family. And Abraham obeyed. Abraham's father was en route to the land of Canaan, but settled down when he got to Haran, which was not his original intended destination. That we can see in chapter 11, of Genesis 27 to 32, when Terah, Abraham's father, took off from Ur, he was headed to Canaan. But along the line, settled at Haran and died there. It was after his death that the Lord came to Abraham and said, Now you get out from this place and go to where your father was heading to, which couldn't get to. Let's look at this in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 32. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, verse 31, let's move back to 31. And Terah took Abraham, his, Abraham his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth with them from all of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. 
the original destination. And they came unto Haran and were there. And verse 32, and the days of Haran were 200. Five years and Terah died in Haran. So he couldn't get to where he was going. He died along the way. And then in chapter 12, now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of your country. So the Lord came and said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your kindred, from your father's house, unto a land I will show So in the discourse, we are going to see the Lord's urgent instructions to every one of us in our categories. The instruction that God is bringing to every one of us according to the category that we belong to. Then after that, we will quickly see the blessed promises of the, of the Lord God to the obedient. Blessed promises of God to the faithful. Then we move from there to look at hindrances to obedience and compliance why people don't comply with god's instruction and directives then we'll be concluding with the consequences of non-compliance and uh, disobedience to god's instruction now in genesis chapter 12 the instruction was clearly stated and in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 31, there is also a clear instruction God gave to people. And in Romans chapter 11, where we read, it is also stated that the time is fast spent and clear instructions given on what we should do. Let's look at... Uh, Romans chapter 13 again. The 13th chapter of Romans. And let us look at uh, verse 11. And that knowing the time. The people were expected to know the time. The people that Paul wrote to. Just as the people were expected to know the time in which they live. It is expected of you and I to know that we are in the last days. We are at the threshold of the coming of the Lord. Soon and very soon, he will appear. And the commitment he has given us to live for him and to work for him. When he comes, he is going to ask us what we have done with our lives here and what we have done in the work he has sent us to do. And so, knowing the time, and now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is fast spent. The day is at hand. Then instruction follows. Let us therefore cast off the works of uh, darkness. And let us put on the armor of light, works of darkness, every work that does not glorify God in our lives. We are expected to put them off. These are days that evil is uh, growing like mountains. Every day there is increase of sin. Everywhere is polluted. And it is expected of you and I that those who have been overwhelmed by what is happening should get out of it. And those who are out of the work that God has called us to should quickly return to the work. And then the night is fast spent. The day is uh, at hand. Then verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and in envy, not in quarreling, not in envy one another. 
So everyone that is listening to me must find out where God wants him to get out and what God wants him or her to get out of. For Abraham, he needed to get out of his kindred, out of his country, out of the land. For you, as a pastor, you need to look at what is God saying I should get out of. And for you, that you are coming for the first time, you need to look into your life to find out what does God want me to get out of. And for you, that has been there for a very long time in the church, it is your responsibility to search yourself. This period, it is your responsibility to be honest with yourself. It is your responsibility to look diligently into your life. And my own duty also, to diligently look into my life, to find out the area that God is instructing that I should do something. Now in Numbers chapter 16, there were these men that gathered together and ganged up against Moses. Korah, Datan, and Abiram. A point came that they came together and they began to against Moses and plan against Moses and say some nasty things. They were offended with Moses and uh, when this got into Moses, yeah, he called them for reconciliation. But they were not listening to Moses. And so, after all the pleadings of Moses and they insisted in going their way, now Moses was instructed to tell the people that have joined themselves with these rebels to get out of the congregation of rebels. In Numbers, the 16th chapter, let us look at verse 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses and said, and unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourself from among this congregation. I may consume them in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and will thou be wrought with all the congregation? The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up. In other words, get out from about the Tabernacle of Korah, Nathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got up. From the tabernacle of Korah, Nathan and Abiram, on every side. And Nathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons, and their little children. Now Moses instructed people that have ears to hear that they should separate, they should move out from the camp of evil men, from the camp of rebels. And so, those who have ears, they are bad. These days, there are camps in the church. These days, there are people that are taking side with unrighteousness. There are divisions in the church. And God is saying to every one of us, examine yourself in which camp are you? Where do you belong to? It is time that you have to separate from the fellowship that does not edify you, from the friendship that does not add value into your life, from the people that instead of 
relationship with them making you to increase in knowledge of God you find that they are depleting your life they are making you to go down the Lord wants you to get out from such association as a youth as a pastor as an adult as a whosoever you are you find out that the company you find yourself now is not a defying it's a company that runs down the church it's a company that everything they are saying about the church about the ministry about the the general superintendent about the leadership of the church is nothing to write home about now if you find yourself in such gatherings it is time that you should get out of that and then and take side with god now when apostle paul discovered that the corinthian christians were yoked together with unbelievers now apostle paul issued a clear instruction that his people should take clear from fellowship with men of darkness in second corinthians chapter six second corinthians the sixth chapter you need to examine relationship you are keeping you need to examine those who are your friends i'm not talking about even friends outside the church i'm talking about people that are in the church you need to select who should be your friend you need to select who you will relate closely with otherwise you discover that the the poison of the last days that many people have contacted the poisonous things that that go with the last days that have infected many people that soon you become infected there are many people in church that are carrying infected mind and that is because of relationship they are keeping that is because of who they are listening to that is because of who is talking to them now in second corinthians chapter 6 and reading from verse 14 be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers this unbelievers are men not be unbelievers outside the church but unbelievers inside the church today unlike before we find few unbelievers among us but as it is today it is like the number of unbelievers in the church have overwhelmed uh, or overtaken the number of believers we find unbelievers among the choristers we find unbelievers among the ministers among bible discourse teachers among prayer warriors and among people that are handling one uh, business or the other in the house of god you ask me how do you know the report we are getting and things that are happening in the church they are happening because there are unbelievers in the church why do we have quarrel among the music ministers why do we have people dragging for who to marry among the prayer warriors why do we have uh, envy among even pastor's wife why do we have what we have today that are ugly things it is because unbelievers have infiltrated the church and have even gained uh, gained uh, uh, access to the pulpit access to ministering to others and god is saying you need to put your ears down and put your eyes down to be able to find out who you should be with and and take a stand otherwise you will become a you will you be influenced you'll be polluted and then and you will be punished in chapter six again of uh, second corinthians and let's read verse 14 be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness 
what communion had light with darkness and what concord had Christ with Belia or what part had he that believed with an infidel what agreement had the temple of God with idols for you are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them and walk in them I will be their God and they shall be my people we are for Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The condition for becoming a son of God or a daughter of God is to hearken to this instruction of uh, Looking deeply to who you are associating with and then and taking a stand. And for those that bear the vessels of the Lord, those that are bearing the vessels of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 52 verse 11, there is a clear instruction that the bearers of the vessels of the Lord should separate themselves from everything unclean. Isaiah 52 verse 11. And so the question you need to ask yourself now is, what is the wrong thing you are into? Are you in a wrong relationship? Are you in a wrong marriage? What is that wrong thing you are into? What is that wrong group you have found yourself? And what is that wrong activity you have found yourself? It is time that you should get out of it. That's the point. It's time to draw the line. It's time that... You, you draw the line and then and take advantage of the inexhaustible and unsearchable riches of God's mercy and God's goodness so as to become a partaker of what God has arranged for this time. Now, when Moses came down from the mountain, Mount Horeb, where he spent about 40 days and 40 nights the people thought that Moses had died. And so, as they thought that he had died, they went into abomination. Many, many abnormalities came in. They, they went on with that. And when Moses saw what was going on, Moses called for a separation. Moses called that people should take a decision. And then he, he called. Who is on the side of the Lord? You cannot be on the side of the Lord and continue in activities that do not promote oneness. You cannot be in the side of the, on the side of the Lord and continue in activities that will promote quarrel in church. You cannot be on the side of God and continue in activities that promote immorality in the church. As a it looks like immorality is overtaking the church. You cannot be on the side of God and continue in things that rather than edifying the church is defiling the church. You cannot be on the side of God and you are using your mouth the way you are using it. You need to check the way you use your mouth and, dis uh, and decide. Will I continue using my mouth this way? In Exodus chapter 32, let us quickly look at uh, verse, uh, verse 19. And he came to pass as soon as he came near unto the camp that he saw, the calf and the dancing. The calf that the people introduced and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of the hands and break them in it, the moment, what, have, what are the things we are introducing? When Moses was with them, there was no dancing. There was no introduction of the calf. For now that Moses has stayed away for 40 days and 40 nights, only now look at the damages that have been done. I want to let you know that if there were damages only for 40 days and 40 nights that Moses stayed away, 
I want to let you know that if care is not taken, a lot of damages have been done even in the church and in the movement all this period that our pastor have been indisposed. Now, to these people, uh, the Moses asked Aaron, why did you make these people naked? What evil have you brought upon them? And he gave him an, the answer he gave. Now, look at the instruction. Look at the call. Look at the command. That was given by Moses in verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the lost side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So when the call was made, people decided, In this Easter program, God will have you to take definite stand on certain things God will have you to be decided about how you want to serve God and where you want to serve God if you want to belong you belong fully if you want to follow you follow fully not that you are following and you are not following not that you are, you are in the movement and you want to introduce certain things into the place you want to change some things by your lifestyle you want to belong, you belong fully. If you don't want to belong, you do well to take a stand. And so Moses called on the people and said, Who is on the lost side? Let him come over. And then the Levites decided and then and took side with Moses. And then instruction was given. And so for the seven churches of Asia Minor and their angels, that is their pastors, God had an urgent demand, an urgent instruction for each of those churches. The church at Ephesus looked at the church and said, you have lost your first love. So, you need to come out from where you are and then embrace the first love. There is still a chance for you. And then to another church, he looked at the work and said, I have not found your work perfect. To each of the churches, he discovered where they were not measuring up and then and gave instruction and threatened that except they do the need for it was coming heavily upon them may the lord not come heavily upon you and upon me in the name of jesus so what is the lord asking you to get out of right now think about it do not delay or hesitate to obey and to comply with it. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Isaiah, the first chapter, let us look at verse 18. Come now, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, shall eat the good of the land. Or if you refuse and rebel, shall be devoured with a sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now this was uh, Isaiah. After he pointed out the bad situation of God's people. How they were degenerated. How they got into rottenness. How evil overwhelmed them. He pointed this out and then offered them opportunity to make correction. And then I said, if they be willing, they will eat the good of the land. Or those who will continue in their rebellion, told them that they will be devoured. And so, it follows that the God of heaven, they want every one of us, according to our category, as a pastor, look at how you have done the work. And uh, as uh, any person in the church, take time to examine your relationship with God and God's instruction concerning you, your person, and all things you are occupying. Now, in the days of Lord, 
Lot was commanded to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But he lingered because of some reasons. However, he was forced out of the city by the angels of God. May we not linger. May we not delay. Unfortunately, on the way to the city appointed for escape, the wife decided to look back for reason known to her and she became a pillar of salt. These days, there are many people that have left Sodom, but they are looking back to Sodom. They have left evil, but they have been enticed. They have left the world and said, I'm a child of God. I've embraced Christianity, but they are still, the interest in the world is still there. They are gradually looking back. Now, when Lord and his family left Sodom, it is a picture of a Christian leaving the world. So after you have left the world, and you are still looking back to the world, you want to copy the world in the things we do. You need to go to visit our marriage, marriages this day. You need to go to attend to watchman weddings and see the style of dancing and see the movement of legs and see what people do and what people wear. And you'll be asking, is this still the watchman we know? Or is it another place? That is because we are gradually looking back. We are gradually returning to our vomit. And the world is forcefully coming in to drive the church. Many, many years ago, a writer spoke, one of the ministers spoke, and was saying, he sought for the world and find the world inside the church. And he sought for the church and found the church inside the world. That is where we are now. And I want to let you know, many places have been conquered. The eyes of Satan and his cohorts are on the watchman. And it looks like we are trying to bow. But I pray that this period will be a period of uh, our coming to our senses, our coming to ourselves. This journey is a journey that will end in eternity. Soon and very soon, many will go into eternity. There are some people that were in December retreat and who attended even pastor's meeting, but now they have gone into eternity. They have gone into eternity. And once you enter into eternity, there will be no opportunity to make amend. So then, the world and her things may be what the problem is now. You have to be deliberate in separating from the world. You have to be deliberate in dealing with the world. In First John chapter 2, John said, Love not the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lost thereof. For he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so, need to be deliberate. You need to make up your mind. And James chapter 4, verse 4 tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 29 to 34 makes it clear that. Those of us that have the things of the world, live not, we should not live as if we have them. And in John chapter 17, Jesus clearly stated that I am not of the world, and you are not of the world. We should check it, every one of us. Gradually, love of things of this life, love of money, can enter into the church, and even church authority. We can live pursuit of souls and live pursuit of salvation of men into pursuit of uh, things that, that do not count. It is time that every one of us should awake because we are dealing with somebody that is subtle. If you read Second Timothy, the third chapter, you will see what the Bible says. This know also that in the last days, 
Perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of themselves. The next thing after that is what? Covetous. What is covetousness? The quest to get money. The quest for things of this life. And so, it follows that God will have you to look at what he wants you to come out. It could be friendship. It could be fellowship. It could be a fellow that God is asking you to separate from because that fellowship, that friendship, that fellow is not adding value to your life of holiness, your life of devotion, your life of commitment. It's not helping you. Rather than helping you, you find that it's making you to go down each time you talk with that brother. Your mind will be biased each time you, you spoke with that sister. You find that you'll be filled with immorality. Each time you, you come close with, to that person, that pastor, doesn't matter, it could be a pastor. You find out that you are filled with lust as a young lady or as a young man. Go to pastor's wife or any person and you find out that rather than being a defied, some, some untoward interest, some ugly thing is growing in your heart. It is time to get out of that relationship. It's time to, to draw a gap. It's time to, to take a stand. And that brings us to the next point. I haven't seen the call of God to every one of us, according to our categories, that you find that where God is saying you should get out. Laziness as a pastor, it could be whatsoever. Now, the next point is the blessed promises of the faithful God to the obedience. In Genesis chapter 12, God said unto Abraham, let's read, chapter 12 of Genesis and verse 1. And the Lord has said unto Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house Unto a land I will show thee. And it is as you get out, I will show thee a land. There is a getting out before God will show. There are many people that are expecting God to show his blessings, show his goodness. God cannot show you his goodness while you are living on your own. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make your name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I want you to take note that we are dealing with God who is faithful. God is a faithful God. If he says you take a stand and you move out of a relationship, you move out of something that is untoward and promises you of something you will do. He remains committed to that which has promised. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9, Paul made the Corinthians to know that they are dealing with God that is faithful. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 24, the faithful is he that called you will also do it. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5:24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. You need to understand that the God we are dealing with, the God who is our God, faithful is not only faithful, is able. It is this understanding that helped Abraham to trust in him. It is this understanding that helped Abraham to obey God when he instructed. And so Abraham and others all had testimony to confirm about God's uh, faithfulness. Abraham had testimony to confirm that God is faithful. And uh, what then are the promises of God which he made unto Abraham? And what are the promises of God that he's making to you? He said unto Abraham that he will show him the land until you and I separate from the things that God has been asking us to separate from. The anointing. 
the other blessings of God, the other things of God you are seeking for, and you have been fasting for, and you have been believing God for, it does not take the place of obedience. It does not, fasting does not take the place of obeying God. There is no substitute to obeying God. There is no substitute to following instructions of God. Unfortunately, many people in church have substituted obeying God, absolute submission, absolute obedience to God with faith, with one thing or the other. But let it be very clear to us that until we are ready to obey, we should forget the Lord doing his own part. In Genesis chapter 13, it was after Abraham had separated from Lot that God said unto Abraham, lift up your eyes. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw that land that God promised. He saw it. In Genesis chapter 13, and let us look at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. All the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to your seed forever. There was a separation before this occurred. As long as Jonah was in the ship that was heading to Tarshish, that ship continued to have a storm. It was when Jonah was removed. There are some people that you must remove yourself from. There are some people that no matter how close they are to you, that closeness have not helped you. That closeness, I'm talking about people that are in church. That closeness have been responsible for the way your life has been. The way your Christian life has been epileptic. There are people that their Christian life is like Nigerian Nepal. That is on and off, on and off. Five minutes. Like they do these days. They bring light. And then five minutes they have taken it. Another 30 minutes they bring it. After they, uh, they, they take it. There are people that are like that. They are epileptic in their relationship with God. They want to have a stable relationship with God. They want to have a stable assurance. Then sit down and look into your life. And see what must be taken away. Who must not continue to be your friend. And when you do, then you are set for God's visitation. You are set for the promises of the faithful God to his obedient one. Now in Acts of Apostles chapter 2, something was done by the apostles before the Pentecost, before the Holy Ghost came upon them. And so, the Holy Ghost came upon them when they sat down. And address what they're supposed to address. And Joshua chapter 7. Joshua had been having victories. But then Anakin came into the camp. Now, that man that came into the camp, came into the camp and then I'm brought in and accosted him. Accosted him must be removed if they must have progress. So, look at your life. What are the forbidden things that have come into your life? Can we ask, can we see your phone? Can we see your phone and have a look at your conversation? Can we see your phone and have a look at the things you are looking at? Now, until you get yourself off and out of those things and, and call it quit from all those things, your Christian life will never be stable. You will not have assurance. Even to receive from God will be very difficult. God cannot make you anything big. God cannot make you anything great until you have come out of sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2, the verse 9, the believers are called out of darkness. 
into the marvelous light. So, and uh, in Ezekiel 36, God promises to bless the people, to multiply them, and shower his blessings upon them. But that is after they have been taken out of uncleanness, after they are taken out of uh, those things that God abhor, abhors, those things that God frowns at. And the disciples of Jesus were made fishers of men. But that was after they have come out of catching fish. And when Peter eventually went back to the profession that Jesus pulled him out of, you know that Jesus was very, very offended with that. There are some of us that have returned to what God had uh, taken us out of, what God took you out of many years ago. I've gone back into it. And you want to convince me that God is happy? No. And so you need to check out what you have left before that now you have returned to. God cannot make you as long as you are still entangled by one thing or the other. Every now and then we come to this pulpit and we are talking about entanglement. It is time that do you make up your mind to disentangle yourself from those entanglements? Entanglement can be anything. Entanglement can be anything. God wants you to get disentangled from those things that are infecting you. After disentanglement, then, then you can now allow the word. If the word has not been affecting you, it must be because of the entanglement. Now, the father promised to Abraham is that God will bless him and will turn him to become a blessing. God wants you and I to not only be blessed, but we become blessings. He's a faithful God. If we disentangle ourselves, we will experience the blessings of God and in turn, will become a blessing to others. Yes. Many of us are ministering. We want to minister health with entanglement. We want to minister blessing. We want to see the move of God's power. We want to see people delivered at your hand. And you're engaging in fasting. Engaging in all night prayers. And the marathon fasting. But inside your life. And you are into some questionable relationships. That God will want you to get out of. Until you deal with these things. All those efforts will not yield any result. It was after Abraham now separated and moved out. That he turned out to become a blessing to others. And a blessing to himself. We can see that in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 to verse 14. Jesus Christ is of the seed of Abraham and the, the blessing to the world. And so when we change our camp, when we change our relationship, God will begin to change everything about us. As in the case of Abraham, Abraham's matters change. Abraham, everything about him change as he changed from the camp. God becomes your God when you change. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, when you separate, then I will be your God. I will be your God. I will be your father. Let no person deceive himself. He that sinned, committed sin is of the devil. There are two fathers. Number one is God. The other is Satan. The other one is Satan. Who is your God? Depends on the life you are living. Depends on your response to God's word. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. He and she that commit sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of God was manifested. And he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, do not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin 
because he is born of God. Tell us you are born again. You are being born again is thinking, praying, speaking in tongues is not a sign that you are born again. There is one thing that will authenticate you are being born again. It is when you are freed from sin. Until you are freed from sin, any claim of being born of God is a false claim. Get it clear. My being a child of God is not because I'm preaching. You can preach more than any person. But it is your life. A personal relationship is what God looks at. Now, verse 9, whosoever is born of God, do not commit sin. When you see it remaineth in him, he cannot sin because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest. The children of the devil, whosoever do not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his uh, brother. Verse 9 said, Whoso is, is born again, do not commit sin. For the seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. And in this, you know the children of God. And in this, you know the children of the devil. So you can now, can now decide whose child you are. And let no person be presumptuous. Let no person live in deceit. And let no person allow anybody him or to deceive her. And let no person deceive herself. Now, when Jacob obeyed God, when he gave him instruction to get out of where he was and go to, up to Bethel, there was the terror of God that came upon all the people surrounding because he took step. He was out of uh, uh, out of evil, out of sin, and uh, he made a change. Genesis chapter thirty-five. You can see a detailed work he did. You could see how he he made sure that everything that connected him to unrighteousness was taken away. In Genesis thirty-five, quickly. Genesis 35, and God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up. In other words, get out of where you are, go to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fledest from the face of his son, your brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you. And be clean and change your garments. Let us arise and go up. Let's arise and get out and go out of this place. And I will make thee an altar unto God. I'll make an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and, I, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their land, their hand rather, and all their earrings, which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. It is time to take away all those attachments. All those attachments. Many young ladies in church have returned to make up. They want to make up because God did not make them well. So since God didn't make them well, they want to make up. Some have now begun to put artificial attachments to elongate, to make their hair long and all that. They are telling God, you made a mistake. These are strange things that have come in into the church. Which when we came in into the faith, we were taught to drop these things. We were careful. And everybody that we met, any person that has confessed that he or she is a child of God, ensure that all those things were dropped. When I came in, I came in with tongue beer beer. But as they begin to teach me, 
that Christianity is associated with cleanness and neatness. I saw reason to drop that. For these days, we find even people mounting up our puppets and wearing this and giving one excuse or the other. As if we started our Christian life when we were old. I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 20. That was the first time. And then and later, I lost the experience and gave it back at the age of 22. Now, you could understand at the age of 22, my body was, uh, was uh, delicate and all that. But, but, I needed to keep clean. I needed to do that because my faith, my new faith that I came in requires that I should be different from others and I obeyed. Today, excuses and flimsy things. People say things that don't hold water. However, God will have us to think again. What then are the hindrances to obedience and compliance? Samuel told Saul, that to obey is better than sacrifice. When he was sent to destroy the Amalekites. And he did otherwise. When we listen to the wrong persons. And read wrong books. Then we will begin to have problems. With obeying and complying with God's instruction. Listening and reading wrong books. And following wrong persons instead of following right people that you know their foundation, you know what they believe, you know what they hold, you know the testimony of their lives. May we inform you that some of us came into this movement and we saw the foundation. We were there when the foundation was laid. And we cannot find anything incriminating. We cannot find anything ungodly. But then, and we came close to our father in the Lord. And then we observed him and everybody was growing. And we were calling him brother, brother. We would call him by his first name, answer him. And, and we were all interacting. And we all grew up to a point that we now begin to understand that uh, he is... We begin to understand the dictates of the Bible and start following. And therefore, you better follow those who know the way. You better follow those who have the genuine experience. You better follow those who came into the faith with all sincerity. Who came into the faith looking for eternal life and not for anything else. But when you read books and follow those that you don't know their foundation, you will have problem with obedience and compliance with what we have been taught now when we become sentimental it can lead us to disobedience yes Saul was sentimental he, he was sentimental in first Samuel chapter 13 1 to 13 you will see the sentiments that he showed and then when the world when the world and the things of the world are allowed to control us, then we will not comply. In Luke chapter 17, 26 to 36, the story of the generation of Noah and generation of Lot that perished, and then which Jesus Christ referred that is going to be with this generation the same, shows that it was the eating and drinking, it was the building houses and and merchandising and make them not to take seriously what uh, we are told. So when we uh, begin to allow the world and the things of the world to have influence over us, there is tendency of looking behind. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the generation of Noah were held up by their fleshly desires from obeying and complying with God's instruction in their day and the same remains the problem of today now lots white became a pillar of salt and we asked and we were asked to remember her remember her only god knew what made the woman to look behind and i can tell you that it could be because of what they have left behind 
could be because of material things, could be because of the worldly things. And she looked behind and lost her life and lost the material things and then I lost the opportunity that God gave to her. So what you think and who you think you are and equally also become a problem so of responding to and complying uh, with God's word. When you look at the contribution you have made as regarding God's work, or even consider your personality and the position you occupy, they can hinder you from yielding totally to God's call of separation. The Pharisees were victims of uh, what they knew. They were victims of what they thought they were. So you must not allow uh, what you think you are, what you think you know, who you think you are, to hinder you from doing right thing. Isaiah did not allow that. And Abraham did not allow that. When God gave him opportunity to correct his life, he yielded, not minding the years he had worked with God. The same thing with Isaiah. And finally, what are the consequences of non-compliance and the consequences of disobedience? You don't need to go far. Look at what happened to uh, the wife of the Lord to see that. Look at the experience of Adam and Eve and look at uh, the experience of uh, Judas. So, from there you will discover that uh, not complying to God's instruction carries heavy consequences. So, what caused the life of lost wife was because of not complying to the instruction of God. And uh, this also led to the, dest the, the destruction of the generation of Noah, except Noah and his family. They did not comply. They did not listen to God's word. Now the angels, even angels that did not comply with God's instruction, were also kept in darkness. So it follows that God is calling every one of us not minding your status, not minding your contribution, not minding who you are, not minding your personality. So think and sit down and examine yourself and find where you need to come out from. Because God is not a respecter of any person. That thing you are doing, God wants you, if, if God wants you to get out of it, please get out of it. Until you get out of that thing you are doing, do not expect that God will be happy with you. Until you do exactly what God wants you to do in a particular matter, you cannot please God. Do what you like to please God. If God wants you to do restitution and you are running around and around and around, because somebody wanted to tell the person, I have said so much evil about you and you call the person and you begin to tell a story until you hit the nail at the head. Get to nowhere. That should be very clear to you. This is time that every one of us should call a spade a spade for himself as you relate with God because time is running out. Time is running out. We are nearer to our grave we are nearer to our departure. We are nearer to heaven. We are nearer to hell. We are nearer to eternity than we were when those years we met ourselves. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we were far to hell and to eternity than we are now. And so now that we are, we are closer to eternity, closer to heaven, Closer to rapture. Should we be should we be loose? Should we hold the things we're holding loosely and lightly? This is the time to tight up. This is the time to tight up all the loose corners of your life. And as you do, you are getting set for the Lord Jesus to take you and when he comes. And remember that he that is often 
reproved for hardening his heart. There is one thing waiting for the person, and that is what? Instruction without remedy. And so what have you learned? What has God spoken to you? Think of Samson. He refused to comply with the order and requirement for his ministry and for his calling. And it cost him his ministry and cost him his life. Think about the man of God from Judah. What it cost him to listen to the wrong person. Think of Solomon also, who did not listen to his instruction. And then I multiplied wives, what it cost him. Everyone that has refused and rejected the call of God and instruction of God paid, paid, paid grievous, uh, made grievous uh, payment to, for that. And therefore, it is time that you look into your life and uh, see what you have discovered that is not what it's supposed to be. What you have discovered that you should come out of. And then I promise God, I'm going to come out of it. Now God said to Abraham, get out. Because he knew that Abraham can get out of it. Don't tell the Lord, take me out. Tell the Lord, I'm ready to come out of this relationship. I'm ready to come out of sin. I'm ready to come out of these things. Just give me grace. And uh, instant, he is unsearchable riches. His riches and resources are unsearchable. He is inexhaustible. Therefore, any person that can come to him and say, Lord, this is what I want, he will make the grace available. Now we can bow down. Heads, we can stand up. We can sit down. We can kneel down. Let us uh, pray to the Lord as we, as we listen to the music ministry where they are ministering I want you to be talking to the Lord and take a decision for yourself. Time is running out. You are in this retreat. How sure are you that you will be in December retreat? There are those who were in December retreat even from Abuja church. But now they are out of the way. They have entered into eternity and there's nothing anybody can do about that. If there is any matter that God wanted them to get out of and they die inside that matter, there is nobody that can help them. Let's listen to the music ministry while we pray and meditate on what we have heard. <laughs>
pastor should take it up from this point and take the people through at session prayers. After that, people can go. And our Father, we thank you because we have had the award. It's a prayer that what we have had will turn out to be means of salvation, not a means of judgment for us. Thank you. Because I know answer the prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. It is time for self-examination. The message is clear and direct. It's time to take advantage of what we had to improve our Lord before the Lord. To take advantage of what we had to make every needed adjustment, every needed change, every needed realignment, if you may. And the songwriter said, I would have I hid in that I have I hid in my heart. As we hide this words in our heart. I use it as a mirror to both examine, assess, and reassess. As we had this word in, his, in our heart, I use it as a guide. The Lord will help us, but we must make the move. But we must make the move through prayer. Prayer coming after resolve to obey his word. <laughs> you can't remain where you are and then asking him to help you. What is that you need to move away from? The message hammered on that. Have you resolved to move away from it? That relationship that is not helping you, that is not building you up, not building up your faith, not building up your relationship with God. What is your resolve about it? That lifestyle that borders on the love of the world. What's your thought? What's your resolve? Men and brethren, this is how to tap into these things that benefit there from and grow there from. By hearing and uh, acting, by hearing and praying on based on what one has decided. I decided to obey your word, therefore help me, O oh Lord. But I have agreed to obey your word. I have agreed to do as instructed. I have agreed to do as I commanded. Then help me, O oh Lord becomes the necessary and reasonable prayer to back that resolve up. That is how they become better after a retreat. That is how they grow to the next level after a retreat program. 
They see that the thing that was hitherto hindering them is no more hindering them, but because they heard and acted. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. I want to thank you once again for your precious word. Word of healing the mind. Word of healing the soul. Word of healing the faith. Word of building up Men and women of consequence, men and women of stature before the Lord. That's the word we have received, Lord, and we are not forgetful hearers because we have not come to deceive ourselves. Stay in this hours. After all, some people left. Lord, but we stay behind, but we remain connected, and we continue to listen and to participate. Righteous Father, that effort must yield, must yield something good for our life, O oh Lord. Must make us to, Lord, stand up, to be the man that you want us to be, to be the woman you want us to be. To be the youth, the believer, the son and father that will yield and obey your word. Moving away from what we need to move away from. Changing from what we need to change from. Adjusting from what we need to adjust from. Rejecting and renouncing what we need to reject and renounce. No more like dog that goes back to East Wallow. Everlasting Father, your word is in operation. Because your word is spirit and your word is life. Lord, I pray that they work out your purpose. Work out your purpose in all that I've heard in Jesus' name. We are closing for the session, Lord, but we are not living out of your sight. Let the war continue. The war that we had, let it follow us home. Ringing in our heart. Pointing out to what we need to do. Pointing out to, Lord, what we need to move away from. And what we need to embrace. Everlasting Father. Yes. Let it continue to ring. It will not return to you void. Lord, that it will accomplish that for which it has been spoken. For the preaching cannot be in vain. And in the morning you will bring us again. And the work will continue. And intensify in Jesus name. May we share the grace by saying. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. And the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be and abide with us now and forever. And surely. His goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. God bless you. We we'll come to the end of this session. Again, we resume by 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, the meeting is over.